provision and of culturally and linguistically appropriate services during emergencies conference of the IMIA Regional Conference here in Portland, Oregon, 2019. My name is Ana Catalina Jones, and I will be your MC for today. Please forgive me if I look a little bit nervous. Um, I am. It's the first time I do this, so um, I appreciate in advance your patience. But it is a great honor for me to be here and to tell you all about what's going to happen today in this amazing conference. Um, I work for Language Line Solutions, and I am also a board director for the National Board of Medical Interpreters, and I am very pleased to be here today with you. We are going to start out with our opening remarks, and I would like to welcome um, our guests. Um, of course, uh, we have Dr. David Cardona, who is the president of the International Medical Interpreters Association. We also have Akiko Saito, who is the Director of Emergency Operations of the Oregon Health Authority, as well as Andrew Phelps, who is the Director of the Oregon Office of Emergency Management of the or within the Oregon Military Department. Um, so with that, I would like to introduce Dr. David Cardona. A big round of applause, please. Good morning, everyone and welcome. I'm so glad that we have a really good group of people here. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, I'm Dr. David Cardona. I'm, I used to be the language access coordinator for the Office of Equity and Inclusion here, uh, the Oregon Health Authority. I used to work in this building many years ago. And I had the opportunity to interact with Akiko uh, many years uh, ago because I wanted to see how um, uh, we can provide language access services uh, for people with limited English proficiency. And one of my goals was to make sure that um, we had a plan, a language access plan. And I'm very happy that we were able to, um, to do that. And, and Akiko has a really, really good program right now um, in that regard. The International Medical Interpreters Association is the largest uh, trade organization of medical interpreters in the nation and we, globally as well. We have different chapters in Mexico, in Japan. Uh, we have also chapters in Europe. Uh, they are really working really hard in regard to education, training uh, for medical interpreters. Uh, in addition, uh, uh, the International Medical Interpreters Association is very eager to collaborate and to partnership with other organizations in the state, in education and government and uh, federal uh, government as well, in effort to make sure that people with limited English proficiency, people with disabilities, people with functional needs receive uh, all this help that they can get in a time of a, an emergency. As, as right now, you can see what's happening in California with those fires that are really, really horrible. And you can remember what happened with Hurricane Katrina. You can remember what happened with Hurricane Maria in, uh, in Puerto Rico. It was really, really difficult. And that's why it is important for the International Medical Interpreter Association as interpreters to make sure that we are trained in this field in emergency preparedness so we can provide a better service to all of you. Uh, so once again, I thank you so much. I would like to take this time to thank everyone who helped us to uh, put this conference together. I'd like to um, uh, specifically thank uh, my dear colleague, Akiko Seito, who thanks to her and her team, we were, we were able to be here today, uh, the state building and all the support that you have given me during one year of planning uh, this event. Um, but I'm really happy that we have two options right now. We have the psychological first aid on the other side, and we have the cultural linguistic appropriate services conference here today. So I think that this is going to be great. I also would like to um, uh, thank my staff, uh, Carolyn Campos, I hope you're watching, and also um, Maria Baker, um, our staff um, outreach uh, coordinator as well, who help us to put everything together. And thanks to everyone, all the different speakers who uh, took my call. I know it's kind of hard uh, to come uh, from different places, but thank you so much for, for supporting us and supporting me and believing in what we do, and, and thank you for being here. Thank you. Thanks 
you, Dr. Cardona. And now uh, we would like to hear from Akiko Saito. Big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, ohayo gozaimasu. Um, as you probably know, my name is Akiko Saito. I am uh, of Japanese descent. My father came to America uh, many, many years ago to St. Louis, Missouri, and he didn't know any English at all. And he met my mother, and he, within three weeks, um, they got engaged, and without any kind of language uh, between them, except for the language of love. So um, this is really important and near and dear to my heart, because I think that one of the things that we need to do on a day-to-day -day basis is to be able to communicate with one another. And we certainly can't do that in an emergency to get the most the best information out to our communities if we don't have that um, translated uh, culturally and lingu linguistically appropriately. So welcome to everybody. It's so wonderful to be here and to see everybody's smiling faces today. Hopefully you were able to get coffee. We did um, end up getting cups for the coffee, so please go get uh, some coffee. Um, but I can remember a year ago when David came to me and he gave me a call and he said, I have this great idea um, to actually do um, the conference. It's going to be in Portland and we want to do it with an emergency preparedness and response theme. And I said to him, absolutely, that is most amazing. Please do that, let us know how we can support you. So for this past year, he and his team have been planning an incredible day for you today. We also have, um, across the way, we've got our State Emergency Registry of Volunteers in Oregon, which is our medical uh, volunteer team. Um, we've got about 2,700 of our servor volunteers in our registry, so if you are a licensed healthcare professional and want to register, please do so. We need a lot of people who are able to also translate um, medical information. But we do have um, the psychological first aid in the other room, and I wanted to give a shout out to Teresa, Teresa Costa. She is one of our serve or volunteers, and she actually deployed with us to the Umqua Community College shooting. We were able to open up a free behavioral health clinic there for the community. We were open for 16 weeks, and we were able to get 10 of our serve or behavioral health specialists to actually see patients on a day-to-day -day basis. We were open six days a week. And Tr Teresa was one of our um, servor volunteers who deployed, and now she's teaching the psychological first aid class across the way. So um, it's really kind of a, a big full circle when we talk about emergency preparedness because this is such important work that you are doing. Um, we know that David already talked about the California fires that are happening right now, um, but we're having more intense events like the California fires. We had fires here in Oregon, um, but we're having more intense events. We're also having more complicated events. We've got the vaping response right now, if people have heard about that. That's a lot of information that needs to get out to communities. Um, we also have things like the Salem water crisis that happened a couple of years ago, and we're trying to make sure that we are translating all of that information um, into the correct languages so that people had that information so they can make good decisions. So this work, your work, is really important in what we do. Um, you really help our communities to be able to understand these complex and intense emergency um, events, and you're able to also allow families and leaders in our communities to really have the information they need to make the best decisions for their families and their community members. So thank you for all that you do. A big thank you again to David for having the vision and the wherewithal to do this, and a thank you to his team and also to emergency management for being here. It's really great to have partners um, at the state level, federal level, local level, and our tribal level to really help us in this, in this event. So thank you so much. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much. And now we would like to welcome uh, Mr. Andrew Phelps. Thank you, David, for having us. Uh, it's so important, I think, that uh, when we talk about the hazards we face here in Oregon and the challenges that we face, that we acknowledge the importance of the partnerships. Uh, we can't do anything on our own. Uh, there's not any disaster or hazard that we face uh, that is a single discipline that's going to challenge, uh, that's not going to be challenged, a single level of government, uh, a single jurisdiction. All the, the hazards and, and bad days that we deal with, they span all of those uh, areas. 
So when we look at something like a Cascadia subduction zone earthquake, anyone ever hear of the Cascadia subduction zone earthquake? Okay, great. Well, then my time is over. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we want to make sure that we acknowledge uh, the challenges, and, and we're very realistic, I think, about the gaps that we have in this state uh, as we address something like a Cascadia subduction zone uh, earthquake. Uh, but it's important to know uh, that when that event unfolds, if you're here in Oregon or in Washington or anywhere in the Pacific Northwest, chances are you're going to be a disaster survivor. You're going to make it through that. So we need to make sure uh, that the lives that are saved following a Cascadia subduction zone quake and tsunami, that those lives are sustained in the weeks, in the months, in the days, and years that follow. Uh, it's going to be a challenge. We know that we're not going to have everything we need to respond. But we want to make sure that uh, the, the biases that we have in Oregon, uh, that those biases are acknowledged and they're not barriers to enacting an appropriate and efficient response. Uh, one of the things that we look to do in every disaster, Akiko mentioned a couple of emergencies we've had, the water crisis and some others, uh, is the provision of timely and accurate information. Uh, in Oregon, uh, we know that ensuring emergency information is delivered quickly is important, but it also needs to be delivered in an equitable, uh, inclusive, and in a culturally competent way. It's important that we look beyond what I would need. Uh, someone who speaks English has access to resources, uh, and technology, think about what folks who don't speak English, don't speak my language, don't have the same access to information and resources and technology that I have. What do they need to hear information and receive information to make good decisions for them and their family? So we'll continue to work with you all uh, to build relationships with you, the communities that you serve and the people that you work with and support to make sure we're able to provide messaging and information so that those folks can make uh, important decisions for themselves, their communities, and their families as they deal with the recovery from uh, bad days, whether it's a Cascadia earthquake, a snowstorm, something weird that I can't pronounce in the water that's presenting folks from drinking it, uh, or a handful of other bad days that could, could face uh, our community here in Oregon and around the region. So thank you all for what you do. Thanks for being here today, and we look forward to building this partnership. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so um, now it's time to hear from our sponsors, the Oregon Health Authority, as well as Telelanguage. Mm -hmm. Akiko will say. <laughs> okay, perfect. So let's welcome Akiko Saito again. <laughs> I don't know if you forgot me, but I was just here a second ago. Um, I, you know, I, I kind of just wanted to uh, specifically call out some of the work that we're doing right now. Um, I think Andrew just talked about making sure that in a response, and even before a response, that we really have an equitable approach. Two years ago, our uh, program, the Health Security Preparedness and Response Program, we uh, decided that we wanted to have somebody very specific to equity. So we hired a health equity planner, and um, right now she's actually on her way to Salem. Uh, she wanted to send her regards to say hello to everyone. Uh, she's going to Salem because we're working with the Office of Emergency Management and with the Department of Human Services. Last June, we were able to come together, our three agencies, and we put together a really wonderful forum uh, in Salem, and it was called the Inclusive Emergency Disaster Workshop. And what we really did was we talked about all of the different communities um, that actually have issues around disabilities during an emergency. And so we had about two-thirds of the, the folks who came to the forum who were people who had um, some kind of a disability. And so one of the things that we're wanting to move forward is we're having a disability advisory council. And um, within that council, we're actually right now looking at those members who have uh, applied to be on the console. And we really hope that this console is going to actually help all of us in an emergency to be able to respond and to be able to uh, make sure that all of our community members, especially those who are vulnerable, um, will actually have a voice. And so the idea of the console, it's going to be two thirds of people with disabilities who will be on the console because we certainly are not the folks who um, understand what it's like to live um, with a disability. And so one of the things that we really want to uh, just share with you is that our work is, is really important. It's very much community-based. 
we do believe that it's incredibly important for health equity and that means that everybody um, understands exactly what's happening in emergency and that communities are actually given the tools to be resilient and to be able to support uh, themselves in an emergency. And so that's some, something that we're doing and something that I wanted to share with you because um, we're sort of putting our money where our mouth is and really saying this work is important, what you do is important, and we're really happy to be one of the sponsors here today. So I don't want to take up too much time because there's so much other stuff to go on. So I'm going to turn it back again. And I promise this is the last year of the year. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Wonderful. And uh, do we have um, Tilla Language? Hi. Perfect. So now we're going to hear from our other sponsor, Tilla Language. Hi, good morning. My name is Kaz Yamasaki. Uh, thanks for having us. It's our pleasure to uh, sponsor such a great organization. We've worked with David in the past, but he was a medical interpreter. Um, we provide service in over 300 languages. Uh, we do this here locally in Portland, Oregon. We started 30 years ago. Uh, currently, we provide over the phone, video, document translations to medical facilities, uh, PSAP, 911, uh, all across the country. Uh, working with 300 languages, uh, you come across uh, professionals in all capacities. There are those that do this uh, you know, as a student, as teachers, on the side, and then there's professionals that do this full time. And when you have 300 languages, uh, sometimes you come across those that are not as professional that you know, uh, hurt the overall image of the professional interpreter. And in the last year especially, the image of the interpreter has changed greatly. We work with hospital administrators, uh, charge nurses directly, the doctors that work directly with the interpreters, and I, I, it's, it's because of organizations, conferences like these, that shape and change the image. And you guys are on the front line. I see a lot of familiar faces, people that we've worked with in the past. I know sometimes you don't see eye to eye, whether that's uh, the going rates or contracts or <laughs> little clauses, the minimums, but. You know, we do work very hard to make sure that everyone, your work is recognized, that you're not just someone that's doing this on the side to earn extra income, that will do overall goals to make sure that the LEPs are receiving the care that they need. Uh, I especially want to thank every one of you. You guys are on the front line. You are the image of the professional interpreters. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. And now it is time for our keynote presentation, Disaster Life Cycle Impacts for Medical Interpretation. And I would like to tell you a little bit about our keynote speaker, Professor John Burke, who is a 23-year member of the Sandwich Fire Department in Massachusetts, where he currently serves as the chief of the department. He was previously deputy fire chief overseeing operations, community risk reduction, and special operations. And prior to that, a uh, fire prevention officer, um, he is graduate uh, instructor at the Boston University School of Medicine's graduate program in healthcare emergency management. Welcome, to Professor Burke, and here you go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. I think I had the longest commute, maybe. Uh, it's here, 10 hours on a plane yesterday, but it's all good. Very happy to be here today um, to do this presentation. You'll see me again this afternoon. I'm going to be doing the exercise activity this afternoon, which happens to be a wildfire, which is very timely. And we're going to talk about what your role is as medical interpreters in, in these types of disasters. All right. So what are we going to learn about today? Uh, we're going to learn about how the disaster life cycle and emergency management affects you as, as interpreters. And I'm going to go in a couple slides here and talk about what my research has been the last close to 10 years believe it or not, in medical interpretation uh, when it comes to emergency management. We're going to discuss communication and technology that is available and is open source, and we're going to validate your own personal emergency plans for all hazards. And the last piece, again, this is important that you are prepared, okay? What we learned in Katrina um, is that your retention rate for uh, first responders in a disaster, you could lose a third of your workforce, depending on what happens. So with my personnel, and I preach this, is making sure that you're prepared. And if you're prepared, you can do your job effectively. Uh, if you're not prepared, that's when we run into issues. So we are gonna discuss a little bit about that uh, towards the end. Um, so this is where everything started for me. Uh, it was a project called LIST. 
uh, language interpretive services training was through the BU School of Medicine and the US Office of Minority Health. It's a pilot project uh, that we developed and partnered initially with uh, two counties, Montgomery County and Los Angeles County. Um, it's been a seven year collaborative program. How do we include language and cultural services into the incident command system? So the summer of 2012, uh, we actually did our first exercise. Um, it's funny to hear Cass speak from telelanguage because one of the things we looked at many years ago was video, the ability to do some type of FaceTime. Um, how can we have an interpreter that's uh, 2,000 miles away actually integrate into the, into the operation? Uh, it's good to see that's where we are now and, and making strides. But in 2012, we tried it for the first time. Um, we actually did it in Montgomery County. Maryland, and they have what they call a 311 center. So if some of you are familiar with those, when you call, basically you can log any complaint you want about the county. And they have uh, 20 call takers. And we actually practiced uh, a scenario where they would have to include language line or um, some type of interpretive services and actually uh, work together. So that was seven years ago, and again, we're still moving this project forward. Um, the original group, uh, if you're unfamiliar with the Henry Jackson Foundation, they're out of Washington, D.C., but these are all the folks that uh, initially participated. And one of the things we looked at is Medical Reserve Corps. They're pretty familiar with MRC, right? So one of the things we did is we did a recruitment program for MRCs to recruit medical interpreters. And there's a difference between somebody who can speak the language, just can speak it, and somebody that's actually a medical interpreter. This is a very, very important distinction I tell my students. You can't, and sometimes the instinct is grab anybody off the street, right? So we have a firefighter that speaks Spanish, grab, you know, grab Jeff, he'll be the one that'll do the interpretation. You have to be very careful, as you folks know, I'm preaching to the choir, that you wanna make sure that the service that's provided is accurate, timely, HIPAA compliant, right? And, and represents your organization. So that was one of the things that we pushed, is in our local MRCs, we had a ton of people that could fit the building. Uh, that could help us in a disaster. So that started many years ago, um, and again, it still happens today. Everybody familiar with CLASS, right, Office of Minority Health? It's a required, um, they have an online training program. It's required of all my students in Boston to complete. Um, it's an excellent program, and it basically improves the outcomes for Americans by addressing the cultural and linguistic barriers of care in racially and e ethically diverse populations. So, <coughs> excuse me, I come from um, a community that's 98% white, okay? And what, what am I doing teaching this stuff? I'll give you an example, right? We had a, a situation, H1N1, which people are familiar with, and we doubled that as our flu clinic, and we pushed, my community's about 25,000 uh, year-round residents. We did a great job, we vaccinated everybody, right? Everybody was happy, except, except we had a group of workers that were from uh, Eastern European countries, that came through that did not speak English and they wanted to get vaccinated. We had no idea what to do. We had no idea who to access to, to translate and it left a black eye on our, our whole thing. And when you think about that, 99%, 99.5% of the population was served with no complaints. But that one complaint is what basically drove me to see the things you uh, see me doing today. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so again, it's so important that we have this, uh, this training and this education and that it is out there. The culturally competent care, and that's the relationship between responders and disaster survivors. Language access services, what telehealth does, right? Uh, focusing on that communication. And then organizational supports, focusing on those policies and procedures to help responders and response teams provide effective services. We look at the definitions, again, the cultural and linguistic competence, which you're all familiar with that. Culture is very interesting. This is the, uh, culture is not just ethnic, it is, the firehouse has its own culture, right, where I work. It's, uh, there's a culture and a subculture. So now that I'm the chief, I am lost touch with what's going on day to day. There is a subculture that has developed in the last 18 months since I've taken over. And it's interesting to see the patterns of human behavior. Right? So when I took over as chief, I'd been with the department my entire career. In fact, senior members remember me as a 19-year-old just starting off, and now I'm their boss. Right? So the culture, it's interesting. I had some things on my side. Right? I was an insider. 
So I knew everybody, I knew, the, I knew the community, that was helpful. That can also hurt you when you ascend to a, to a supervisory uh, level. So making sure that that culture is in your department when you are the focal point, that it is accepting of the community, it's accepting of everybody, that's a very important thing. So culture can be, like I said, not just ethically driven, um, you know, it, it goes to beliefs and values, and, and what are your core values as a leader that you want your personnel to follow, okay? And then we look at competence, having the capacity to function effectively. And I'll leave it at that. I tell my people every day, just come to work and be competent. We have a different workforce now. I don't know if you've noticed. Um, I have people that have never written a medical report, a pre-hospital report. They type everything. So, because everything's electronic. So when they come in to interview, this is, this is a cultural thing in my department, when you come in to interview for a job, the first thing you do is I give you a piece of paper and a pen, and I tell you, describe yourself uh, in a paragraph, writing in cursive. <laughs> so some people are laughing, because some of us were taught cursive. And the looks that you get, this is how we line up whether these are gonna be qualified people. The people that argue their way out of it, I want no part of, right? Well, this wasn't, this isn't fair. When I hear that, they're already done. I haven't even gone into the next question, right? The people that just do it, they just buckle down. It may look like the Unabomber wrote it, but you know what? <laughs> they did not complain and they did the task, right? That's so important. To me, that's confidence. I see that. That's confidence and the word competent. And so it's important that, again, are you competent and do you understand and I tell my employees this, everything that's in the community, not just your own little world, but you're gonna deal with everybody. And, and are you competent to that? Um, five elements of cultural competence, uh, awareness and acceptance of difference. So like I said, I came, and my community is 98% white. So I go to Boston University in 2008 to get my master's degree, and I'm greeted right away with two students from Saudi Arabia, one from Haiti, and one from uh, China and then there were four from the Boston area. And that was my first introduction. And I made many mistakes uh, along the way, and I've learned many lessons. One, my Saudi Arabian uh, fellow student who was female was very westernized. So when we first met, she shook my hand. I assumed every Saudi Arabian woman at that point would accept a handshake. The next student that came in the next year, I went like this and was told that's a no-no. Right, so in my head I'm like, all right, what am I, what am I doing wrong here? Um, in my graduate project, I spent time actually out here. I was out um, near the Grand Coulee Dam in uh, Eastern Washington with the Colville Native American tribe, and I was there for I did a three-month project. I ended up going there for the last couple of weeks. We were doing this drive-through EDS distribution, and it was very interesting. It was on the sacred grounds, and there was actually trash on the ground. And I went over and picked it up. And Larry Bird it right into the trash can. And they came over to me and the, the chief was like, you don't touch anything that's here. And I was like, ooh, okay. I thought I was doing something helpful, but I was not. And that led to acceptance of difference and incompetence. I'll never make those two mistakes again in my career. So it's important, I tell my both my employees and my students this, that you have to be aware and accepting of difference. And, and then when I got the faculty position, and my first group of students was after the Haitian earthquake, and I had five doctors from Haiti come to take the program. And they invited me to a voodoo, um, it was a voodoo burial in Boston. I said, where, what am I doing? I was afraid. Literally, I was like, this is gonna be like you see on TV. It was one of the coolest things I've ever done. Talk about accepting. Right? We have to learn how to accept differences. Very hard to eliminate bias when you go into a situation, but exposing yourself to these things as you go through makes you more tolerant and more understanding and actually a better um, emergency management leader. Looking at your own cultural values. Right? So what are your own values? What do I value more or less? I value the Patriots, right? Football. <laughs> this is probably Seahawks country, I gotta be careful, but um, what are the things that I value? I value, I mean seriously, work ethic, right? Being on time, doing tasks. 
helping the community. These are all things that, that drive me every single day. Going back to a couple of slides ago, when you set the tone in your department, that's what you set the tone with. You are here to serve, they are not here to serve you. Sometimes we get confused, right? We're here to serve the community. So understanding both your own cultural values and awareness and acceptance of difference um, is one of the keys to cultural competence. This was, uh, I was in Washington, D.C. This is probably hard to see, but I got a patch from the Metropolitan Police in, uh, in Washington, D.C. They have the Chinatown unit. So I spent some time um, with them talking about day-to-day -day operations. And one of the things they were, they were telling me, the, the officers assigned there, is understanding and managing the dynamics of difference, right? So various ways cultures express and interpret information. I think that's important. Right? So a reaction that you may see or one may see may be very normal for that particular culture. All right? So understanding kind of what those expressions are. Development of cultural knowledge. Knowledge of specific cultural groups. This is important too. Right? You don't have to know everything, but it's important that you are educated and that you understand basically these cultural groups, what some of the specific things are and identifying facts about each different culture is important. Also having the ability to adapt activities to fit into different cultural contexts and adapting practice to fit culture of the community that's served. So in summary, those are like the five elements of cultural competence that in terms of emergency preparedness should be part of your, basically your plan and your operation. Just some statistics with diversity in the United States, and these are uh, a little bit older, but you can see the projections. And I have to add one group to this. So we talk about um, you know, Asian, African American, Native American. There is another subgroup, and I'll just put it in plain English. It's uh, the geriatric population, right? So that crosses all cultural boundaries. But what we're looking at now for healthcare delivery and, and especially in my department, is 39% of my community is 65 and older. 39%. The projection in 2029 is over 50%. Right? And we're all going to be facing this in some form or fashion. So this is another, another group uh, that we're looking at here for um, diversity in the United States that we have to plan for. These are the languages. Um, you know, and Kaz talked about 300 languages. There are languages, I know like five, right, until I started teaching. And to understand the different languages that are out there and the dialects, it was, it was very interesting. And, and one example I, I will give you is in Haiti. What do they speak in Haiti? Creole. Creole. There's Haitian. There's a third dialect that's a mixture of the two. And my five doctors from Haiti, when they were uh, up in Boston, they were telling all, out of the five, all five spoke all three dialects. And they said it's so interesting that language evolves and, and to have the understanding and the knowledge of, of what languages are spoken in your specific community. And that is my responsibility as a public servant to know who my constituents are that we serve. If I'm not doing a language demographic analysis in my community, that I'm doing something wrong, right? So emergency management, you need to be able to not only look at, obviously, the uh, risk analysis of you know, uh, you have earthquakes here and all these potential natural disasters, but what is your demographic in the area that you serve? And can you fill that need if necessary in a disaster? I think that's uh, it's definitely something that we have to pay attention to. Again, some of the other statistics on racial makeup of disaster personnel. So it's very interesting to see. Um, and there's biases out there. New York City cops were all Irish, right? City of Boston, that was a definite back in the day, right? All white Irish. That was Boston police. And when you look at it now, the diversity is, is excellent because it serves the community. It serves the community well. And having diversity in responders um, I think is, is critical because it also feeds into the culture of your organization, okay? And if you can have both a, a diverse uh, workforce 
and also project uh, a culture of diversity in your organization. I'm not going to say that you're foolproof from anything happening, but at least your personnel or my students are aware as they go into the workforce that these are the things that you have to be looking at. This one's real hard to see, but um, yeah, let's skip over that one. Anybody familiar with this picture? So, uh, Boston had a, an issue in the 70s with busing, when there was forced busing, and this is a, uh, they call it the Soiling of Old Glory, it was a Pulitzer Prize winning photograph, 1976, um, and Ted Landsmark is a gentleman that, uh, the African American gentleman that, um, who now runs, by the way, the Dukakis Center for Government at Northeastern University, he was an attorney. But I remember as a child, as a child, I was three when this happened, but my parents still talking about that years later as a soiling mark in the city of Boston. And this, this photograph was just put up a couple of days ago, actually, I saw it again. Um, they had the, whatever, the 40th anniversary uh, of it. But pictures like this, right, you don't need words when you look at that. And understanding why you feel a certain way about a certain group allows you to address those feelings well, before you have to assist someone from that particular group uh, in an emergency. And to this day, this photo, and I show my students every year because I teach a class in cultural awareness. I, this is the first slide that I show them with no writing, right? And the eyes go, because most of them weren't alive when this, A, they weren't alive, B, they had no idea this occurred in the city of Boston back then. And when they see this, they're like, well, how does that happen? And this is something that, again, has stuck with me um, basically since I was a child, this one photograph. And disturbing on many levels, right, when you look at it, and it's like, this guy was just minding his own business, Ted Landsmark on the right. He was trying to make his way through City Hall, and a group of students, um, he ended up getting attacked. And again, we don't want to see things like this, and it's very, very good for my students when they see it the first night of class. And I tell them, tell me what you feel right now looking at that photograph. And, and then we talk about how we make sure that in emergency management, we are serving our community uh, appropriately. All right, so move on to a couple of quick things on disaster preparedness and response. So with anything, we're always preparing. There's always a preparation phase, right? So I'm always preparing for the next disaster. That's what they pay me for. Um, some of the things that I never thought I would see in my career, active shooter. Asher is the, the term that we use. Um, about 30% of my preparedness budget goes to active shooter training and awareness. Um, so being prepared. Then when you actually respond, hopefully you have plans in place that uh, will help you respond. And that's to hopefully you know, remediate, lessen the impact on the community and, and make everything better. Then you hit that recovery period, which can be extensive. And this is the, it's, it's, the recovery uh, piece is so overlooked. Um, everybody looks at the, the initial response piece, and then when it's over, when it's over, I've done ex uh, extensive research in this with the marathon bombing in Boston when that occurred. Boston Medical Center is right across from, uh, from the university. And one of the things we asked is, did you do anything, when the nurses came back to work the next shift after you know, the, the days following the, the, the marathon bombing, did you do anything different? And it was just like another day at the office, right? And we worked with them to, to affect some change where if you've had a dramatic event in your organization, you have to, especially in, in a, in healthcare and public safety, you have to be cognizant of that, your employees coming back, that they may need to be eased back in. Not for months, but even for a shift or two. Eased back in because of, of the trauma of what they have seen. The expectation is you can handle it and you come right back to work. Right, so one of the things we're looking at now is, is long-term recovery is action, if we have a significant incident in my department, pediatric death, something traumatic, when that work group comes back to work, I actually bring extra staff in. And I staff the shift with three extra people in case somebody has an issue. 
they can feel free to step aside, not for the rest of the shift. If they want, they can step aside for the rest of the shift or take a couple hours to themselves and then come back. Okay, so that's a key, key thing in recovery. You folks are on the front lines of that, right? Preparedness, you do that every day. You're asked to respond at a moment's notice, sometimes inconveniently, sometimes conveniently. And then what's the recovery? So when I looked at the marathon bombing, I said, and remember, the marathon had people from all over the world. What was the impact on the medical interpreters who were basically passed around for hours with no breaks? Did we consider what the impact is for them, or do we just assume it's another day at the office for them? It's hard to be the middleman or woman, right? And so when we do disaster planning, we look at recovery. Yes, we will acknowledge the men and women on the ambulance, in the front lines, in the ER, but what about you folks? And are you part of that process? And, and that's something, again, at the university level that we're, we're looking at to address. You need to, it has to be a holistic approach in recovery, meaning the 911 call taker to the last nurse that saw that patient. Sometimes that's 20 people. But all of those people should be uh, evaluated or at least assisted or spoken to at some point. Some of the events that you're going to deal with, severe weather, we'll talk about some man-made stuff and then some agency-specific incidents. Um, so again, what would apply to all you folks? We had two tornadoes in my area this summer. We very rarely have those. We get hurricanes all the time. Knock on wood, we haven't had earthquakes, which you folks out in the western part of the country here um, more used to winter storms we deal with once a week uh, in the winter time um, and then uh, a derecho which uh, is like a dust windstorm that is uh, common in the southwest part of the United States but also in the Midwest which the drought and dust storms are part of that and then uh, space and atmospheric debris drops right so this is kind of odd uh, we've had a couple of these in my career we have uh, a military installation that abuts our jurisdiction and some things have fallen out of the sky some things planned some things not planned um, one example was the National Guard was lifting a Humvee with a helicopter it was strapped and they were moving at about four miles there was a temporary flight restriction they made a slight adjustment it was right over the major highway and the thing fell into the rest area and people called 911 and said a car just fell out of the sky. <laughs> were they wrong? They were not wrong. So things out of the ordinary are going to happen. Um, and again, that's one of the things that, uh, that we also teach our, our, our employees and you should be aware of. And then sanitation, homeless crisis, sanitation issues. I had a student from, uh, actually she was from Lebanon, in the Middle East, and her whole graduate research was on the, the trash issue in Lebanon and how it is just destroying public health. And you never think of that as a disaster. But now we have a plan in my community if either the trash haulers go on strike or there's an issue where you cannot dispose of the refuse in a timely manner, a continuity of operations plan for trash, believe it or not. But trash affects everybody in this room. We all generate it, we all have to get rid of it, right? So imagine that type of disastrous impact. And what would your role be as an interpreter? Not necessarily a medical interpreter, but getting the message out, the information out to uh, the public as to what to do with that, all right? So there's all these things that we're, we're looking at that, uh, again, are impactful. Man-made disasters, uh, terrorist activity, we all know uh, all too well. Um, human error with equipment, human error, uh, technology failure. We talked about sanitation. And then again, workplace violence, which is unbelievable where we have come in the last 20 years. Where not only do, um, and we had to get buzzed in this morning, which is a state building, I have no issue with that. Um, but our new fire station, we just built two of them. The newest one that was built, you have to be buzzed in like every segment, which is bothersome to me because fire stations usually are open, but you have to be buzzed in. You can get into a certain portion of it, but I tell the guys in the summertime, leave the garage doors open as long as you're there, that's let the people come in. Um, 
but we're at a place now, unfortunately, uh, where workplace violence is part of the norm. We have to prepare for it, um, and it's something that, uh, unfortunately, we have to write plans for. Um, one of the big things that I've dealt with in my career is unexpected death of an employee, right? So this is not like a huge tornado or a hurricane, but if you have a death of an employee in your organization, it could be crippling. I don't even care what the size of the organization is. So that's another thing that we focus on at the university is eight uh, companies, corporations, departments. Sudden death, unexpected death can be crippling long term to an organization. So it's important that you have a plan for that. And the, my example of that, living through that, is when I was just a little guy, little firefighter running around. 1993, I walk in the door. Still had no hair. I grew it for a while, and then I got rid of it again. No hair, I'm in there, 19, 20, running around. I'm like, this is awesome. And I had a lieutenant who I was assigned to. Trains me, does everything. Then I progress, and I move off, work on another group. About 12 years later, he was going through some stuff. And he makes a 911 call. We all show up at his house. He takes a gun and shoots himself in its head in front of everybody. And he lived for like a week. So we had to treat him. We had to not only treat him, but then the whole week this call went on. And it took us a while as a department to get back into the sink of things. Right? So unexpected death of employee can be crippling. You need to have a plan. Right, as to how you're gonna help people get back to work. So again, that's a big thing that um, organizations overlook. And what is your role in that? Right? What would the medical interpreter's role be? Again, it's information sharing. Information management, getting the message out. Uh, power failures, how's the power situation out here? California's got some issues, right? When you lose power now, oh my God. Like, we just had a storm last week. It was out for like 48 hours in certain parts of town. People are going crazy, crazy. And what we look at now is, in my community, they don't care about shelter, right? They want to stay in their house. They just want somewhere to charge their phone so they can keep their kids quiet. <laughs> so we actually have charging stations at the community center. They'll come for an hour, we'll charge everything up, and then they leave, and then everybody's happy again. Right, so IT failures, power failures, these are things, again, that, and again, an IT failure for you folks is, that cuts your lifeline off right there, right? IT and power failure in your line of work is absolutely critical. So how do we do a workaround for that? And again, be planning specifically. We talk about mitigation, strategies and equipment that reduce the potential impact of an incident. So again, examples are remote access control points via LTE and internet, so we call them FOBs. Um, AT&T has FirstNet, you've heard of that. It's a special, um, basically it's a, a cellular coverage for first responders, but I don't know why you folks aren't on that, or part of it, even know what it is. Only chiefs hear about it, I guess. It's like cool stuff. They offer you AT&T, you get the cell phone, so when everything goes, you know, Everything's down, you still can communicate, right? So my argument was at BU, we were talking about this, is get those, it's okay if I have one and I share it with four chiefs in the four neighboring towns, but folks like you are like critical. You should have a first net access because what if I have my phone with first net, which is great, and then an issue comes up where we need some type of interpretation and language service. What are we gonna do? So these are things that we talk about mitigation and technology and how it's the backbone of what you folks do every single day, right? You should have access to some of these key components that us as uh, emergency preparedness officials have access to. Um, transportation plans, one of the things I'm gonna, I do everywhere I go is I have a plan, right? So what if today in an hour they tell me you gotta leave you gotta figure your way to get back to where you came from, and we've taken all of your transportation away that you had planned. So how do I get back to Boston? 2,500 miles. What are my options? Right? That's an extreme, all right? How about just getting back to the hotel? Is there a way I can do that? You all should be doing that, and this gets into a little bit of personal preparedness. What is your plan? What is your transportation plan? 
And what is your communication plan with your family? Right? Think about that. We learned a valuable lesson in my community during one of the hurricanes where the cell towers were knocked out, but the internet still worked. Right? Does that make sense? The like internet? Yes. The internet still worked. How do you communicate and message through the internet? My 13-year-old daughter will give me 12 ways to do it in 10 seconds. I'm not 13. So how do we communicate? And what we learned is internet-based messaging, you need to have a plan that includes internet-based messaging, not only for your organization, but for you. So what do we do in my department? Right, my department were like, we gotta figure something out. So I got the troops together, 50, 50 people in a room. I need three websites that none of you will ever think about utilizing. Because everybody uses Facebook, IG, Snapchat. So they come back with, their first one was Pinterest, which I found humorous. None of the sandwich fire department utilizes Pinterest. So they said, well, that'd be one. The second one was Words with Friends. And I'm like, wow. We're an uneducated organization. Nobody uses Words with Friends. But we actually settled on that. That is on my phone right now. And Words with Friends is our emergency communication backup. If you get a message, an alert on Words with Friends on my phone, it is not to make the next move. It is a interdepartmental emergency notification. Because all 50 members of my department do not play it, utilize it at all. It seems, is it counterproductive? You look at it, it's actually very smart, in a disaster, I can communicate with all my employees through words with friends messaging, right? So think about that in your own organizations. Internet-based communication is separate from cellular. If you have an internet signal, you can communicate, all right? So that was one of the biggest lessons I learned is having that ability in a communication plan to get the message out. Same thing with the marathon bombing in Boston. I had 20 students at the finish line that day, and I'm working. So the dean's calling my boss, who's calling me, saying, well, you gotta get a par or accountability of your students. I'm like, these are like 20-year-old kids who know more than I do, but I'll see what I can do. Well, the irony is, the first day of class, we get everybody together, and they're like, oh, professor, you have to download this thing called Vines. And I'm like, what, is this gonna get me in trouble? And they're like, no, 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 no it's, it's do these clips and it's cool. Just put it on your phone. Fine. Put it on my phone. So the marathon thing occurs. Well, what do I get two hours into it? 17 of the 20 get themselves in a huddle, do a seven second video saying, We're all good, and the other three have already gone back. So then I call my boss. I'm like, I got par in my 20. He's like, How'd you do that? I'm like, Professor, right? You should know what I'm doing. <laughs> I gave him credit later. I said, no, this is what we put on the phone. That drove our research into internet-based messaging, right? So for disaster planning, your own communication plans, I want you to consider that, that that is an option to get the word out, okay? These are just some of the three ways to communicate with your staff or your family. Three ways, think about that. Email, phone, text, have another backup. Um, cellular text, email, non-traditional. Relay, for, no carrier pigeons, but some form of communication. But there are smartphone apps out there. Uh, and again, the words with friends is what we use. I can't emphasize what a valuable lesson that was for me to learn as a leader. I was deputy chief at the time when we did the words with friends thing. But not being able to communicate with any of your personnel in a disaster, because the radio system was down also. So we had no radio and we had no cellular. So it was basically war in the backyard when you had those Walmart walkie-talkies. We, we had to stay as a group in like literally 10 trucks together communicating on those until the system came back up. Now it came back up within 90 minutes. Well, if you have an emergency within those 90 minutes, you don't care. So communication is critical. Uh, communication plans are key. Um, so make sure that, we, uh, that you have that identified. Practice the parts and pieces of your plans. Right, so we call them CADs. This is the one thing, if you take anything away today, we call them coffee alert drills because everybody will have coffee in fire stations. So we, they, we make them sit for 20 minutes. We give them a topic. They have 20 minutes to work it through. And it could be a small thing. But think about medical interpretation. If 
as a group, you're meeting, you're talking, throw a scenario out there. You have no more than 20 minutes to figure it out. Now, the 20 minutes applies time pressure, right? You can't just sit around. So it, it applies that element of pressure. But these are things we do all the time. Every industry, I don't care who you are, has 20 minutes to think or discuss a, a, a topic. So to be prepared, and for you to be prepared, you can do it with yourself. You can just throw something out there once a day, have it on your calendar. I'm gonna talk about, like my phone popped this morning, I had cyber. I didn't think I was gonna, this was last year, I put things in advance. Today was gonna be my cyber day, just to review. We had a cyber issue at the station, what the impacts are, right? So stuff like that, I think, for preparedness is critical. And again, it helps you uh, practice, uh, whether it's evacuations or earthquake, tornado drills, whatever it's going to be, that cab that you pick for the week, for the month, for the day, as a group, is so important to, I think, long-term success, and it keeps you active. Um, how you execute your emergency plans includes tactic and strategy. So, a couple things. We're going to talk about wildfire uh, this afternoon. Um, but one of the things I want to mention to this group is animals and disasters. So how do we deal with service animals? So let's say we have somebody from the Philippines who speaks Tagalog and they have a, um, a seizure dog, a golden retriever trained in recognizing seizures, okay? And that dog is the lifeline for that particular individual. So we need to make it clear in any type of interpretation that there is a service animal that is part of that and part of that person, right? We've taken uh, service animals, uh, PTSD dogs have been in our ambulance. You cannot turn them away. So making sure that you folks understand, the hospital understands, the pre-hospital folks understand the impact of not only service animals, but animals in disaster. Animals mean everything to ev a pet owner. My wife would probably would definitely pick the dog first. <laughs> first. My daughter said, you're close, Daddy, but I think I'm going with Lucy, who's our toy poodle. Um, I'm going to save the, the dog first. So think about the impact of pets and disaster and on the patient or the person that you are working with. And do not underestimate the, how key that is to have an answer for what's going to happen. All right? And again, that's something that I've learned uh, through my career. And the other thing we've talked about is, again, the technology failure. If you have a vital records or information technology failure uh, within your organization, within your group, make sure you have a, a response plan for that. All right, I'm going to finish up with a couple of slides on, and everybody's familiar with the incident command system? All right, if you're not, FEMA does a great job. You can do an online class. It takes an hour. Uh, it's called Incident Command System 100. They do 100 and 700. Um, but it's actually a structure we use to respond to um, disasters. And one of the things that I put together for the university is we looked at how do we make sure we are incorporating everybody in the community. So if we look at the chart here, um, one of the things that we have is cultural support unit leader. So if I'm in Portland today, something happens in Portland today, and Dr. Cardona says, you've got to work with Oregon OEM right now on something. I have a framework we could go by, right? I would say, all right, there's a certain area of Portland that's affected. What's the demographics? Give me a community leader in that particular piece. There's your cultural support unit leader. Get them, him or her in here now. And under that, they'll have language task force leader. We could volunteer Cass. He's here from Telelanguage, right? Sorry, Cass. Well, we throw him under the bus and say, you're gonna handle language task force. So what's the demographics of language spoken in that particular area? And then ethnic awareness. What am I going into? If I'm an outside responder coming in, is there anything I need to know about that particular area, ethnic-wise? Right? It doesn't have to be super detailed. But I can tell you there's five ethnic areas of the city of Boston, five distinct neighborhoods that are some are separated by three miles that it's like a whole other world. Right? So I need somebody to tell me, what are we getting into? And they all report to this cultural support unit leader. And it goes up the line. And if we're doing this right, whoever's in charge looks really good. 
that they've addressed at least this piece of it. You go to the middle. Who's familiar with GIS? Right? GIS, it's basically maps. It's Google Maps on steroids, or Google Earth. And what happens is, I have a cultural GIS person. I say, with GIS, you can do these overlays. They can be voting districts. They can be all kinds of things. I would say, give me cultural GIS mapping of this section of Portland. This is what I need. They would handle that. And then that demographic mapping manager actually puts pen to paper and says, this is what the breakdown is. Then the third piece, ADA compliance. Everybody's familiar with the American with Disabilities Act? Okay? You have somebody in charge of ADA compliance, and then a functional needs task force. So if we, in this room, were in charge of this today, for something in this city, I feel confident 50% or more of this would be handled appropriately, and I'm an outsider. But we have enough people in this room that fit these particular roles that we can make sure it's executed appropriately. Right? So these are the things that incident commanders, you know, have people to make sure it's taken care of. This is the first time we've actually put this pen to paper and then actually played it out. We've done it a bunch of times now, where we go into a particular disaster area and I say, I'm gonna need about a dozen people that are gonna fit these roles. And within 60 minutes, you guys are gonna do it today, probably 45, are gonna be able to spin out information on the fly, open source, that will help us address whatever the disaster is. And this is something, again, that we have been promoting and pushing to communities to say, if you don't even know where to start, start with this. And then you can fill in the blanks as to who's who, okay? But this is my framework that we use all the time now that, and we still overlook things, but, and again, I'll use the example of a shelter. Shelters are supposed to be ADA compliant, right? So you want to make sure that we have a, a shelter picked out in the city, that the person doing ADA compliance, that the shelter is compliant with ADA, and that there's access points and, and the bathrooms are appropriate, there's handrails, all those things. Me as the incident commander, I don't have time to go look at that. You delegate this stuff down the line and boy, if you execute this appropriately, you look like a hero. That means you have served your entire population. That's my motto with my students. You work for 100% of the people, not 95. 100% of the people expect you to be on your, basically your top performance every day. So this right here is a way to be able to, uh, to make that happen. Recovery, we'll just do a quick thing on recovery. How resilient your organization? Um, unexpected employee or child death, we've talked about that. Um, continuity of operations, the great part about medical interpretation. If the technology's right, you can work anywhere, correct? With technology? That's the beautiful part of your, your job. What I see going on in California right now, let's just say there's a bunch of medical interpreters that their homes are burning. They're unavailable. You could stand this room up with the right technology and be able to help them, and vice versa. Even in Boston, they can do it. When we did our first uh, exercise with this, I was in LA, and the interpreters were all in Boston on Adobe Connect, which is a, like a teleconference software. And we were able to do it, to show that if you have the right technology, you can do this anywhere. So again, recovery, we talked about, it can go on for a while, you need to have a plan for it, um, and I feel that uh, it, it's definitely a key piece. A couple of quick things on workplace violence. If you don't know where to begin, this video, Run, Hide, Fight, Department of Homeland Security has put it out. It's like a five minute video. Prepare yourself, it's not, uh, it's not easy to watch, but it's required viewing for all my employees and my students, just to give you an idea of what to do uh, if you're faced with an active shooter. You folks in Oregon are well aware of the active shooter, the incident at the uh, community college. So again, this is a great thing for, we talk about CAD, remember CAD, Coffee Alertville? Watch the video, talk about it for 10 minutes. Right, it's a great, great piece um, that they put together. Ready.gov, you may be asked to relay this to uh, people that you're working for. Ready.gov 
is the government's um, basically online resource. Resources for families, uh, for disaster life cycle management. They talk about utility shutoffs, how to secure vital records, safety skills. It's an excellent, excellent website. And again, it'll be uh, quite helpful. All right, so that is my contact information. We do have a minute or two if anybody has any questions. Um, I can take questions. All right. Okay. I appreciate you sharing your ICS chart of how it fits into that structure. Yep. Do you do work with emergency support functions? I know that Massachusetts has an expanded model of 18, as we do here in Oregon as yep. well. I'm wondering where do you think it fits in into which ESF to do extended planning efforts? Yep. That's not during so, great question. I asked for ESF 19. 19. So, just because, I mean, this is my, my opinion. This is, you know, we were looking at it. It's so critical, right, that you do this right, that to sprinkle it amongst other, you know, you have health, you have all those other ones that could, but you have enough resources and people that are advocates in this space you could staff it, no problem. And, and what you call it is whatever you call it, but the components of, let's go back, these components, ESF-19, and one of the professors at the university is like, well, you know, what does this mean? I said, this is the cover your ass ESF, <laughs> in reality, right? To make sure you are addressing everything in your state, county, it doesn't matter, right? You could, if you had an issue with language interpretation at a shelter, Massachusetts has a big disaster. There's 40 shelters open. One has a language issue, and it goes to ESF-8 for medical health. They're like, well, I'm tied up with getting cots. This is a lower priority for me. Are they dying? We'll figure it out. No. This can be, and it should be, because the government looked at business continuity and said, well, that's important. We're going to make that. In. Massachusetts has that as an ESF, right? Business continuity, private sector. New York City thought it was that important that New York City has it in their EOC model. They have private sector involvement all the way to Wall Street. Why don't we add ESF-19? Are you getting pushback? Um, people don't know where to begin. Yeah. And what you have to, unfortunately, I don't know how it is in Oregon, but Massachusetts, something has to go sideways. And then you bring it forward yeah. and say, well, there was a plan all along that we were looking at. So what we're trying to do is embed it in hospital, hospitals right now to get it moving. Boston's well known for all their hospitals. If the hospitals start talking about it and say this works on a small level, then hopefully we can get it to a, a, a larger level. Um, but again, when you look at the diversity and the statistics I've shown, and those are older, you have to be prepared for that. And what's the best way to prepare for that? We look at a support function specifically for, you can lump it all together and call it what you will but it's gonna provide you with that opportunity to make sure you're addressing everybody's needs. Kind of a long-winded answer, but yeah, you're welcome. Uh, from Kaz. your personal experience, yeah. uh, you know, what can language companies or interpreters themselves do? Like what kind of issues do you most you know, encounter? Like what, what, what could we do better? Like whether that's you know, accessibility, or the pace of familiarity, terminologies, what do you personally encounter that you feel like you can improve on? So yeah, terminology is the big thing. Because just like you have a language that you're interpreting, public safety has their own language. And if you use like five key terms, right, there's instant credibility. Instant cred that's another thing we're working on is what are those key words, right? If, I, if you're as a medical interpreter and you came to me and said, yeah, you know, what, where's the uh, ICP located? Incident command post? I'd be like, damn, excellent, right? Th then right away I've just painted you as, all right, this person has some idea. Uh, on disasters, and there's that instantaneous, they know what we're, what we're all about. So I think terminology and, and phrasing, mainly terminology for interpreters when they're dealing with not only the hospitals, but emergency managers, is critical. And just some of those basic terms will get your foot in the door right away with, uh, with emergency managers when they hear some of that terminology. Go ahead. Is, is there a, a similar note, is there a a glossary that you are already have besides just going out and googling, you'd be able to share. Yep. With yep. Attendees? So I can uh, I can push it through David through the organization, but it's like top five things 
You get top five things not to say, I'm going to give you five things to say. Right? Five terms that are broad strokes in emergency management that at least gets you some credibility. And then, again, that's all about terminology. It would have a great interface for interpreters to be certain. Response that was my whole point in the project is to embed them in CERC because they right. get all that training. So I'm going to talk to our guys because as far as I know, I'm the only interpreter with CERC or um, that, I, that I know has gone to the trainings. Yep. And I'm thinking, wow, this opportunity. That We've been pushing it. I went all the way to D.C. and spoke to the, the people at the Public Health Service that handle MRC. And I'm like, listen, you've got to start recruiting outside. You have enough dentists and nurses in MRC. What you folks really need to, to start grabbing is medical interpreters. And then if they're cross-trained in CERT, it's like eight weeks, yeah. you're going to learn all the terminology. And then you're going to be able to have a, a skill set, too. I mean, you're not going to be special ops swinging from the, the windows on ropes. But at least you have an idea of some of the day-to-day -day terminology, search and function capability, search and rescue function capability. So that's why I've always been a strong advocate for MRCs and CERTs recruiting Medical interpreters, definitely. Because then we can get our interpreters who take certain get involved, and then that leads to reaching out to those populations Correct. in the area. Because I'm already thinking, all you need to do is get headsets, and you yep. have an interpreter for CERT to get this segment of the population trained. Correct. And, we, and if you Google, and I don't know the name of it, in Los Angeles they do it. I studied it, and it, I ashamed to say I forget the name of the group. It's an all Spanish organization in East LA that tr it's they train they're like sir but they train their basically their citizens and it, it just keeps turning over so all right how are we for time uh, four minutes four, give me the four minutes right, you're doing a great job the five things to say yeah. you want me to say those now uh, I, I, I have some of them so uh, go, go ahead no, I just have a, a Yep, so the execution is you get all the information, and then say we pick one shelter that this is where all the activity is going to be. Then you start asking for the technology support that you're going to need, the, so internet capability, et cetera, at this particular shelter. A lot of this can be done virtually, right? These people don't necessarily have to be boots on the ground. You're doing all of the, basically the background work, and then, then you're bringing this forward to the operations side saying, this, these are the things that we're going to, to need at that particular site, i.e. people, things, stuff, et cetera. So a lot of this can be done prior to the storm hitting, prior to anything. You can have a lot of this prepped for your particular area. Then when it actually happens, right, if I'm, and we come across a certain uh, part of the city where a need is is needed we make the call we know we have people in these spots that can basically direct so they get the call yep and then they have a network they reach out to get the interpreters that they need correct my as an incident commander i would say to my cultural support unit leader i'm expecting you to have the ability to get whatever interpreter we are going to need that's my objective as an incident commander that's all i say to them how you go about Recruiting and getting those people and making them available is on you as that that person, that cultural support unit leader. It could be telehealth, it could be whatever, but you are responsible at that point for executing the mission, right? Getting those people. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And it's uh, and again, we've done it a couple times. It's worked. It's worked very very well, um, and it, it keeps you engaged. It keeps the they're on their toes, definitely. All right, I will get the, I'm back this afternoon. I'll have the five 
things, so you won't leave today without five things. And then I'll push it out to Dave and we'll make sure the whole network gets it. All right, thank you for your time, folks. We'll see you this afternoon.